Hello and welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online conflict transformation summit exploring pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures. I'm Eva Schoenfeld and I'm very pleased to welcome Ted Rao uh, to here to talk to me today. I know Ted because uh, I have done the training course on his, his sociocracy training course which is absolutely amazing and I would thoroughly recommend to anybody, just as a, a slight um, plug there. Uh, and I'm gonna pass over to him to introduce himself a bit more. Yes, hello Eva. Um, hey. Yes, you already mentioned that my main work is around sociocracy, part of sociocracy for all. Um, I really am a linguist by training um, and I dropped out of academia after after working as a linguist. Um, let's see, another big thing in my life is that I live in intentional community, in a co-housing community here in Massachusetts, where I am right now, that's home. Um, and I moved to the US 10 years ago. So sometimes people detect, English speakers detect my accent, that's where that comes from. Um, five kids, partner, that's, that's the home scene here. Great, thank you. And, and a warm welcome to you. So to kick off, could you give us a bit of the story, the backstory for you, how you kind of, what your process was to, to get into your line of work and also your, your relationship with conflict and how that's been for you, how that journey is, has gone? So for me, I think the way I tell myself the story is, um, so it starts with me being part of a big family. I, I have thri three siblings myself. I have, I have um, five kids in my own family, right? So being part of a big group was always a logical thing for me. And I, um, yet I was not equip equipped with um, yeah, good conflict skills, typical tumble conflict avoidance in my family of origin as most of us have so i see that as you know i was settled in mainstream world um, where things are the way they are and i just had this strong strong longing for something else um, and i think it was then moving into a co-housing community which made perfect sense to me that I was introduced to other ways of looking at conflict or looking at it in the first place as something that we don't just ignore, but that might actually be helpful and useful. Yeah. Uh, so that certainly the way we're addressing conflict here, which is typically very proactive and very, um, yeah, very much in the restorative culture that had a big influence on me. And I wouldn't have encountered that outside, it's like where, where I come from, that is not being done. So. Yeah. And then looking at sociocracy, sort of moving into, into that world, um, how would you say, what, what would you say its angle on, you know, the inevitable conflict that you just put humans in a room for even a little while and this, <laughs> things start to creep in? So what's, what's the sociocratic take on that, the fact that we, that we have conflict? Yeah, as you're saying, it's unavoidable, right? That that kind of stuff happens. And what sociocracy does really, it's a system to keep things um, organized so that we can make sure not as much conflict even arises. So it's clearly the strongest in the preventive area. So just a little example, sometimes people get upset in meetings because somebody talks for a long time and we don't get heard, right? And that, then that can trigger all kinds of stuff for people for good reasons, because being heard is important. And one simple thing that sociocracy does is doing rounds, right? Speaking one by one. So the not having been heard thing, we've already prevented by simply doing that. And it's what I find interesting about sociocracy is that it puts those things into place. And though we can choose to change them and say let's not do a round right now the default is set to like that safety net of if you just follow the default you'll be fine because typically everything is covered but we're not we're not confined to it right we can override it but our default is pretty safe and robust already uh, like and what i like in particular about that is because 
I've been, you know, humbled, like had my share of being humbled um, that we typically are all, very much of the time we're not at our best and then the systems help us be at our best. So, for example, if I do rounds, I don't have to track whether I'm taking up too much space because that's already taken care of for me. So the way I think about that is it's a system to help me be the person I want to be for much of the time without e just by sticking to, to the standard process. And I really appreciate that because it's taking like the, the, my mental space can be taken up for something else. So that's the preventive aspect of it. A lot of it is also, and I noticed that just more and more and more, the more I, I just work with groups is the, is how much lack of clarity triggers conflict so much. You know, like, for example, you have two groups working on similar things. You know, this group is supposed to be in charge of that. This group is supposed to be in charge of that. One of them isn't clear about it, starts doing something that the other group says they hold, and boom, there's conflict. Mm -hmm. And it, there was no bad intention, right? Everybody was just trying to take care of things. It's the lack of clarity that triggered conflict. And that's one of the things where I appreciate sociocracy of just being absolutely crisp and clear. Like we have the means to make, to create the clarity that we need to the level that we want so that we can find that nice balance between it's completely clear, which means I'm empowered to do things. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm allowed to do and so on mm. to the level that I'm comfortable with, to, you know, so that I don't go to the level of total micromanagement, but um, having that nice um, ease of knowing what's happening. So that's, that's for me, creating clarity is huge. And sometimes that's all it really takes. And then it clicks well into place. For example, when we have, when things do get messed up, there's the accountability, like all the systems, feedback systems of, oh, we forgot to look at that. Well, you know, it sort of comes back because we build those loops into the system. So then we have one way to recover or to, to catch things that fell through the, through the cracks. And then it just clicks into place with restorative practices. Like, for example, in my community here, we combine sociocracy with restorative circles you know, with nonviolent communication, like all of those then really mesh beautifully into something that really feels fairly, fairly safe. Yeah. Yes, because I remember um, a friend who works in a, a sociopathic organization saying that um, sociopathy works really well for people who have a kind of level of insight into their own process. Um, and less well for people who are, um, you know, less aware of what's going on for them, less able to kind of handle themselves. I mean, I guess you could say that with any with any system. But then those those restorative processes, they they kind of grow that um, that ability to relate to ourselves as well as to other people. Right, and I would say it's gradual, right? I mean, I've been I've been invited to a restorative circle as a participant. Um, I think it was actually four weeks after moving here. Um, you know, that takes like, whoa, okay, there we go, you know, jumping right in. Um, yeah, but it was great. I mean, I say that now, looking back on it 10 years after, right? It wasn't all that easy in the moment. But um, what am I saying? I'm saying that it doesn't take a lot for somebody to need something at the level of restorative circle, which is already a pretty big and powerful tool, right? So it's something I would pull out of the out of the hat if I really need something strong and like solid, sort of for big problems, right? Mm -hmm. Um anyway, what I'm saying, I'm saying that it doesn't take a lot for something that I'm doing with best intentions to rise to that level of sort of catastrophe. So um that was interesting, you know, because I was fairly unaware of what was going on for the other person, to be honest. So um, I guess my whole point is that I wouldn't so much peg people by, by self-awareness, but more accept that we will all always be on the spectrum of screwing things up, you know, with all levels of awareness and, and intentionality about it, but things will get screwed up. That's, that's pretty certain when you put, yeah, as you were saying in the beginning, if you put people together. Um, and I guess 
maybe it's also a level, something that I'm noticing here that I find really interesting, but I haven't really fully thought through the whole thing. And mm -hmm. that's that I'm a friend of mine who is a leader of the circle that is conflict management um, in, in my community. Um, she was talking about that and reflecting about it on her experience. And then somebody asked her, well, how many, how many times do you have to do conflict resolution in the community? Yeah. And then she was sort of reflecting on it and the number seemed high. I don't know what she said, but the number of mediations, restorative circles, sort of interventions was higher than the other person expected. And then I wanted to defend our community, of course, and think like, yeah, and that's not necessarily a sign for how much conflict there is, because I don't think there is a lot. But our approach to conflict is, okay, something happened, let's address it. Like we don't tend to look the other way all that often. We really try to take those opportunities. So for me, it's more a sign of health that there's so much intervention. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. it's hard to good, find good measures on that, of course. But in my interpretation, that's, what, that's how I would say it. Yeah, I think it, I think if it's part of your culture, it, it, it it must help. I certainly know that for me, if, yeah, intervening early and often, it m makes conflict, yes, it makes it happen more, it makes it, it surfaces it more often, but it makes it less drastic. So, and for me, the thing to get over, and it's interesting thinking of that happening at a community level. For me personally, the thing to get over is at one end of my kind of conflict avoidance is, oh, that's just tiny. You know, that's, that's too, too little to be worth bothering about. It's petty. Now, I'm going to seem really petty if I bring that up. And then the, somewhere in the middle, it crosses a line with, you know, a, a, only a micron of space in between. Yes. This is too big. This is going <laughs> to just like break everything. And I don't know, you know, how to expand that space in the middle. Or, or maybe just, you know, notice my judgment of my own kind of um, responses as being either too little to bother with or too much to deal with. Um, You're right. That's such an interesting one. I completely <laughs> agree. It's funny how that is. Yes. Yeah. That I is guess if there's, if there's support at community level, that we think, as a community, we think that those little bits, those little things are actually really worth surfacing it's worth saying yeah okay it was just a small thing it's worth bringing out because maybe there's a useful conversation to be had right. um that you know that's so supportive that idea that my community would be encouraging me to surface those things just, yeah it's, one one big thing for me that i'm that comes up for me around that is that it happens out of respect right because it's so much easier to write a person off of like oh that's just so and so you know that's there she goes again that's just what she does you know written off if inst and then really addressing the conflict is a sign of of respect and and valuing that other person of no this is you know i don't want to write you off and just saying that i actually trust that you will receive if i say hold on the way that email that that you know that didn't work for me because mm. uh, so there's that aspect to it too right yeah so, so just sort of digressing a little bit into into your community and the way that that happens how do how do conflicts get flagged who decides the conflicts worth a community process uh, the people who experience them so we have actually that's that was a big learning for us and i'm not yeah, it's still un, unclear to me. It would, would need more data, but in our experience so far is that the circle is best off if it's just reactive and not proactive. So we would not have um, can council, it's called here, can council circle. I would not have them, or they would not want to knock on people's door and say, so we heard, you know, there's this conflict that they're involved in. Um, they don't do that. They don't. I think they've. I think they burned. They 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 got burned early on, and then realized that is not the role they should be playing. What they are is more like a sounding board, right? And what they do then on a policy level is putting things in place, like what is our support system, and they have like different levels of escalation. You know, like first, for example, the one thing they have the lowest level intervention is what they call offering a listening ear, which is basically just. Um, 
an empathy session in, in nonviolent communication terms, but they don't even use that term because it already seems too formal. It's just somebody's going to listen to me. Right. They offer mediation, they offer restorative circles, and they offer Byron Katie stuff. Are you familiar with that? Um, Byron Katie, the, the, it's, a, it's a way of questioning your own assumptions and just trying to become more aware that what your assumption is of what somebody should do or should not do, that you might actually have like a confirmation bias thing going that maybe it's not as clear cut, like that person is wrong. Maybe there are other things and maybe you all, you, yeah, it's just the way I think about it or somebody has described it to me as trying to get a little bit of space between you and your own assumptions. <laughs> Just like holding them a little lighter, you know, you might still, you know, everything else might still be the same, but just having a little bit more room. And it's sort of a process to get you, get you to question your own assumptions a little. So that's, that already feels like a pretty deep thing. Free bug forms is another thing that we do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just a practice of writing it down for yourself of, you know, when you like very basic NVC kind of thing, but when you send that email, I felt this and that, you know, and just very basic, but it helps you think about what what is really going on in a way that can be heard by the other person. So I appreciate that one too. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And also, you know, I heard the kind of um, the sociocracy embedded in all of that. The kind of you know the fact that there was a policy, the fact that there are various kind of stages and steps, and it's that um, you know that kind of uh, very sort of logical, clear things are laid out um, in front of you in a kind of really comprehensible way that uh, I think sociocracy brings you know really beautifully. So it's your your whole community is is sort of socio sociocratically structured it's it, it, and that's yes, how yes. you would express it it's not kind of like did, did the sociocracy come first or the community come first or did they happen together <laughs> well it's an old community so it was formed in what was it 1994 so the first 18 years i hope i'm getting my years right here the first 18 years it was run using whole groups and consensus and then eight or nine years ago it switched over to sociocracy which here is called dynamic governance but still same thing uh yes and i think in terms of its dna it swings really well with sociocracy because we have a very, very high level of trust in people and groups and processes and so on. So, for example, when there was at some point in a circle that I was involved in, uh, an, a decision that had been, or a conflict had been around for a long time, it was had to do with pets. And most people who live in communities know that outdoor pets are a sticky one. Yeah. Um, so the pet discussion had been smoldering those, you know, the entire time and people have moved out because of like, I, you know, it was bad. Like it would be bad. Like it was a serious thing. And it was the first decision that we tackled after introducing sociocracy. Really? Yeah. So that seemed a little risky, right? <laughs> and, but the policy is made. Nobody has questioned the policy in those eight years, like it really just calmed everything down. And mm -hmm. even though people, not everybody loves the policy, they're actually people who really dislike it or think we should have done something else, but everybody respected the way the policy was made and therefore it has still calmed things down. People say like, yeah, I don't like the policy, but it's good that it's made and I respect the people who made it. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, the trust level is really, Hi, not everybody has to approve everything, and that's why sociocracy works well here. Yeah. And I remember Jerry talking about how that policy was made. He did a lovely <laughs> uh, uh, kind of like expose of the whole thing, and then he, he called it the dog policy. And then yes. his kind of his his last line was, and then we had to do the cat policy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, oh <laughs> yes, all of it. <laughs> but it sounded like it took a long time. I mean, weeks and weeks, if not 
Oh yeah, there was a lot of yeah, yeah, a lot of loops, all the, a lot of feedback loops around that. And by the way, there's one fun fact, and that is clearly, since you mentioned Jerry, clearly has his handwriting imprinted on it. For example, so that yeah, dog policy, cat policy, they're different, and each of them have have a long story to it. But one thing I find really admirable about a cat policy is the following: so that if and it has a lot to do with conflict and conflict resolution. So if you get an outdoor cat which is basically a bird killing machine in the, you know, from the perspective of some of my community members. Mm -hmm. So there you have the extreme, for for people not familiar with the issue, let me lay it out very quick. So some people see cats as um, almost invasive bird killing machines, okay? Mm -hmm. That shouldn't like only exist in the numbers that we have because of stupid humans having them as pets in a way that is artificial. The other extreme is, you know, the cat that is the family member, that is like the best friend of one child in the family, maybe even therapeutic, you know, like really important and like a way to be in contact with nature. Like you can say many good things about having a, out, an outdoor cat. So our policy, besides other things, we have a limit on how many cats and so on, but that's all, that's all policy level that's rather boring. But one thing that's really interesting is if you get an outdoor cat, you have to talk to your neighbors and you also have to talk to the people who you know have strong opinions on the other side. Mm-hmm. So that you can't just, you know, go like, oh, ha, 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 policy allows me to get a cat and I'll just do it and nothing else. You have to, the way Jerry, who put that in the policy, and that was his idea, uh, you have to at least witness the other people's pain around it Mm. doesn't mean you have to do anything else you can do it and there will be people impacted by it Mm. that to me is sort of brilliant because that i wish just happened more often right that we don't just ignore things but we face them while knowing that we're not gonna that our mind is not we don't have to how do i say this we don't have to be different Right, we don't have to do something else, like not get a cat. It's okay to do it, but we can't also we also can't ignore impact on other people. Yeah, and do you know? You know, have you ever had any feedback from people who've done that? And you know, is there anyone who's changed their mind, or what? What kind of impact has that had? Well, people have people have gotten cats. Uh, let's see. Do I have any input on that? I think. I think the biggest thing it does is that people who are the bird lovers and the cat haters don't feel like they're screwed over by yet another person that is getting a cat without consideration. Yeah. You know that that I'm I haven't I'm not aware of anything that is worth sharing from people who've gone through the process by, sure. and sure. got a cat. But the other side, I have heard that people go like, "Yeah, you know that seems that seems fair." Yeah. Yeah, and they get to say they get to say how they feel and what, they, what their position. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And there isn't there isn't a huge amount of that that happens. And particularly if things, if you know that things are controversial, quite often people well people either don't do them, even though they want to, or they do them right. and say you know fuck you, let you guys. Exactly. Yeah. All the neighbors that have <laughs> yeah. I, I was just remembering around the time that happened, actually, a neighbor of mine who lives not in a community, but just has a, you know, a normal neighborhood with like a neighbor who's an asshole, you know, like, and the whole, like how something can escalate. Like it was just something about where the water flows, basically whose driveway is being washed out, you know, and if the neighbor builds a little bit of something, so it goes on her side, then all of a sudden, right, like, just the nastiness of what neighbors can do to each other. It's wild with zero acknowledgement. Yeah. It's it's sort of the opposite story of that, right? Just no, it's my it's my backyard and I'm doing it's my right. Yeah. It's one of the most one of the most difficult relationships there is, I think, is that there is, you know, in most setups, there is that close relationship and that impact on one another with with no structure, no accountability. You know, and, and the, I've got got friends who've worked in mediation, and a good deal of their, you know, stock in trade is neighbours, because 
somebody's done something and then it just kind of escalates into this war of attrition. Um, yeah, yeah, really tough. Yeah, sometimes I notice that when I think about um, people's reactions, since I do sociocracy both in community world but also in business world, sometimes the business people look down on sociocracy and community as not being the real thing, you know? Like, like, oh, if only you knew, you know, business is easy. Business is easy. Talk about community. That's where the real stuff is, right? Because that's where you have kids and safety and pets and, you know, people's people's... I mean, most of my neighbors, they have their, like all the, all their own is their house, you know, and they own it. It's like the, the, the stakes are so high in community. Um, like, especially in, yeah, if you add the money piece, it's <laughs> yeah. not trivial. Yeah, it was really, it's really interesting to hear about that, that kind of conflict resolution, that, that the group that focuses on that. And it was reminding me that something I haven't, Sort of rage is a, a friend of mine who was um, living in uh, the Amazon for not very long, and the people who he lived with uh, had a routine. And I'm not sure whether they did this every day or every week or quite how often it was, but they would wake at four in the morning, um, and that was their time to deal with community difficulties. That was designated you know, bring up your problems and this is the time and place um, when we'll deal with them. And there was something for me, you know, again, as somebody who finds it difficult to bring up conflict, of having, of knowing that that was the time. Um, yes. So, it's because it always feels like it's the wrong time. It's like, when do you bring up that thing? You know, if you haven't brought it up right away, which obviously, you know, that's the, that's the kind of hardcore time to bring up your, your gripe is just when someone's done something um, and I, you know, I'm I'm working towards that. But to have a, yeah, to have a set time when this is where we're going to deal with that also just seems like, well, that's another way of kind of building it in. Um, and, uh, yeah, supporting people's reluctance to to bring that stuff out. Uh, you obviously can't make people do it. Right, and that's where... I that's why having a system in place like you're saying the like standard time to do it and so on just having systems in place that's how i would describe that right mm -hmm. to make that easy because again for example meeting evaluations is a system there be where you you know where you have the stage it sets the stage now you get to say what was this meeting really like and you can take it or leave it but it is there for you right and I, I mean, it's countless times that I would have totally walked away from a meeting without saying anything had there not been this meeting in my place and mm. where then all of a sudden you have a turn and, well, do I just let it pass without taking the opportunity or do I say something? And so many times I said something and was a little bit proud of myself to not have avoided it just because there was this intentional moment where you could, where you could do it. And I remember I had this whole phase. I mean, really, conflict and feedback are very close together, right, as concepts, because that's, that's yeah, it don't, would be interesting to think about that interface. But and I remember when I understood feedback, like, on a deeper level of, like, oh, this is actually the most precious thing we have, right? It's just so endlessly valuable to get feedback on all levels. Then I put myself... It was around the time I learned about nonviolent communication and so on. I put myself on a campaign and trained myself to just give feedback as many times as possible. And that means positive and negative because then I could do those little snippets and it wouldn't all add up to this big thing of, okay, now it's, as you were saying earlier, right? All the little things that are fine, 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 not fine. <laughs> and to speak up earlier without saying it's a problem just you know just some feedback when you said this i was confused about that just that level could already rise to let's say something and i'm so i mean i'm you know i'm like underperforming big time on that mm -hmm. and as an aspiration and a skill i really love that and i wish i don't know it sounds like any i guess it is an excuse i wonder I guess it's a wondering of what one could build into everyday life more often that would give that, you know, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, with your family, with your 
partner, you know, we have it in meetings because that's where it's sy- systemized. Right. I don't have it in my family. Right. So, yeah, and feedback was one of the things I wanted to ask you about because I, I think I've also seen the potential for it and this kind of like building a building a, a healthy feedback culture in your organization. And yet, for me, there's just like a massive gap between most of the organizations that I'm part of and that place where we can, you know, in a really kind of um, free yet supportive way, mention when things have been difficult, whatever, in whatever way. Um, and so, yeah, that had your, just your, your, your tip there of like, you know, really sticking to it religiously for a little while um, to, to build that muscle might be one way of doing it. You you said in meetings you have like that there's there's space for feedback built in, so there's meeting evaluation. Is there kind of interpersonal? How would you build that into a, a meeting? Well, the the way I frame meeting evaluations is typically around the three things: you can comment on process, you can comment on content, you can comment on interpersonal things. It doesn't have to be all three all the time, but it's that that frame. And typically, I mean, it's also hard to tell them apart, right? If the facilitator yet again cuts you off, it's not necessarily a comment on process anymore, right? It becomes personal pretty really quickly. Um, yeah, so that that. Uh, that is certainly a moment. Then, of course, there are, for example, performance reviews, like role reviews, selection process. The sociocratic selection process is an opportunity to give feedback or hear feedback. Yeah. There's, so there's a lot. There is a lot. And I'm sure there could be more. But what I see is that organizations are even struggling to keep those in place. Sometimes organizations adopt sociocracy and get rid of those, you know. Right. Like, oh, let's just not do that anymore because it's uncomfortable. Like, yeah, I think we should even do more. Absolutely. And the, the, the times that I've used them, um, which, you know, to be fair, I can probably count on one hand, but people have really, really appreciated them. Um, they, they require a degree of, of knowing people, that, that kind of um, selection process, which just to kind of outline really quickly for people who don't know it, maybe you could do that. Just just really quickly lay out that uh, uh, sociopathic way of doing things. So the selection process we use when we select somebody into a role, for example, we select um, a new facilitator of the group, and what we do is we first make sure everybody understands the role and everybody understands what qualifications are useful for that sort of the work leading up to it. And then there's everybody in the circle, and we're talking about a group of five, six, seven, maybe people. They each think silently for themselves who they would nominate. And then we do one round of sharing of who were you thinking you would nominate? And we do it with reasons. So I would say, you know, I would like to nominate Eva because I find Eva and then refer to the qualifications, right? Mm -hmm. I see Eva holding space and listening really well, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then you hear each other, right? And in this, in the change round, you can then change your mind. So like, wow, because of what Ted said about Eva, I would like to change my uh, nomination to Eva because that sounded really convincing. And then at the end, there is a proposal by the facilitator, and then we still have time to integrate objections if for whatever reason somebody says, no, Eva's facilitator is not going to work for the following reasons. Mm. The good thing about the process is that sometimes people get nominated for reasons that they didn't know they were perceived as being good at this or that. The super sweet thing about it is that it's affirmative. You know, we're not saying, well, I'm not nominating this person for that reason, not nominating that person for this reason. That one is also not good, right? That's not what we're doing. We're, we're basically talking about the positive and then the objections only kick in at the very end and that's fairly rare. And then, of course, still important, but it's rare. Yeah. So and that's an opportunity. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really sweet opportunity, like you say. And and I think people that's exactly what people have picked up on when I've been in groups who've done it is like, oh, I didn't know people thought that about me. And you know, that really, uh, yeah, because because 
more than one or two people get a chance to hear at least one bit of feedback, you know, because people will make different choices. Um, yeah, it, it is. It's really, really, it's really nice. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah. So winding back, you were talking about the, um, the way that that's kind of built into organizational structure, but it's not built into personal relationships. Um, that's that kind of those opportunities for feedback. Um, yeah, I was wondering about a kind of a, like a mindfulness bell or, or maybe a kind of shared practice where you're going to go, OK, we're, we're going to look at this um, and and, you know, try and do it over, like you say, like a, like a week or something. Um, because it is it is hair raising for me it's not so much in my in my kind of uh, family relationships it's more those people who are kind of close in um, but not that close that I seem to have a kind of like quite a a zone where I'm really up for being quite brutally honest <laughs> but it's really close in and then there's people outside of that where I'm you know I kind of notice that I gloss over a lot of stuff where I'm just being polite um, and actually not really saying what I think and um, yeah it's it kind of well it adds up over time like we've like we've been saying the kind of strain of that um, yeah there's there's no easy answers are there yeah and I think one thing I want to raise sort of point to that you mentioned is the responsibility in that right because we passing on an opportunity to say something means not stepping up to your responsibility right. yeah and that's yeah that is the inner work that comes with practices like like sociocracy right the the I'm so, remember it that was it really stuck with me because it was such a brilliant summary in in a sociocracy workshop a participant reflected back what i had said and basically said so really you're saying sociocracy means no more excuses <laughs> And I love that because it's true. There's so much truth in that because all of a sudden you have the power. All of a sudden, you know, feedback is welcome and so on. All of that, right? Are you going to do it? <laughs> so, and if not, what excuse do you have that you're not? So the responsibility of that is huge. And I, I remember finding it deeply, um, what's the word? Unsettling is not even strong enough. Just and transformative sounds too positive. It's such a positive buzzword when it really it doesn't feel good in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. It was just stirring up. I guess that's a nice way of saying it. It just stirred up so much shit. That's just, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Being being in that position is not fun at first. I find, and that has to do with again, it has to do with conflict, right? Because one thing that I, that was sort of around the same phase for me was realizing, okay, it's not, you know, first of all, you're now free, congratulations. That means you're now responsible for your own actions and what you say and don't say. Uh, you can't just dump the responsibility somewhere else. And it also means uh, somehow it's intertwined with that of, well, conflict, if we think, like if we take this all seriously, conflict, will always point to somebody just meeting their own needs, right? It's everybody's just doing the best they can and meeting their own needs. Mm. So if we're both equal, that means I have to step up. But that also means I, um, again, as I said earlier, can't just write off the other person as being stupid and inconsiderate and whatever. So then we're responsibly, the responsibility goes up to actually listen to that person and be open to the very likely thing that they make perfect sense <laughs> and that they had best intentions all along the way. And that is also a hard one to accept. I find um, it's hard to accept that other people might just be doing the best they can. And yeah, because it messes with your own system of, of how you would like to see the world, right? That mm -hmm. makes it so nice and easy. Wouldn't things be easy if I were right? Yeah. But, um, Yes, that, that difference between the, the, the 
the inside and the inside habits and then having to kind of meet the 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 complexity of other people's realities um and that and that is you know when it gets out right out into the big world um you know I remember talking with Jerry fairly recently about the kind of you know the very polarized world that we're living in um at the moment where it's it gets more and more difficult to understand those people you know they're not they're not you know they're not if you if you're thinking of these kind of concentric circles of of association they're way way over on the other side it becomes so difficult to um yeah to 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 imagine what what is going on in their reality in their version of the the truth um and yet it feels really important to try to make those you know approaches and and connections to understand somebody whose point of view feels really um you know can feel offensive i think there's there's quite a lot of people whose points of view feels offensive to one another um and if we remember how hard it is sometimes to even understand your own partner <laughs> that brings me back to this quote that we actually I'm trying to pull it up here that we actually I again something I learned from Jerry um the more yeah, it's a quote that basically summarizes that well um the more i live the more i think two people together is a miracle adrian rich uh you know we were talking earlier about how conflict is avoidable and sometimes i even think in the other extreme of like why does it sometimes even work that we collaborate <laughs> different given how much effort it takes to understand somebody who's so close to you and then as you're saying then there's people in the in the wider away circles out you know further on the periphery of my egocentric system like ah, this is just breathtaking what what it would actually take to understand each other it's just yeah sometimes it's very disheartening to me because I, Yeah, I know I see myself struggle and just if everybody struggles like me we're never going to get anywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's what it feels like quite a bit. Yeah. Well, I was I was speaking to um somebody the other day on another one of these interviews who was saying, you know, about how we can hold space for one another. So when when I'm triggered and maybe you're triggered as well, then there's just, there's the conflict group, there's the friend who's not triggered. There's there's the way that it it is more than just um two people having to soldier on and i guess you know in a relationship there's plenty of people going to counseling and there's somebody there who can hold the kind of space of <laughs> of sanity and and not not being kind of immersed in those in those inner stories that that can make that can make life so tough um so yeah i've been thinking a lot about like how do we hold space for one another um yeah uh, and yeah much of much of, the, of what you've been talking about is is kind of quite formalized ways of how of how we can do that using structures um at like in like with Susie Robinson I remember when I started learning about NVC uh I was holding on to the goal of raising my kids so they wouldn't need therapy Okay. <laughs> I know. If, <laughs> I'm like, okay, if they just don't need therapy, then that means I'm a good parent, right? That's like setting them up well enough. Then I let go of that goal and I instead have it as a goal or had it as a goal for them to know therapy exists and that it's a good idea you know <laughs> basically basically i lo- it's not even it's i don't think of it as lowering my expectations it's more the like you know coming around to oh mm-hmm. needing help is actually you know a good it's a good thing and now i would actually even go to the other extreme of telling them to put your systems in place you know like like have your support people have your support system have your go to options like that's 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 what happened for me through things like sociocracy but understanding just how much of a good friend systems are to us so i'm i've really gone to the other extreme in the last 10 years of no 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 therapist 
and five other things like that, you know. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Here's the phone number. <laughs> everything, everything. You need everything. Please make use of it. No shame. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, it's it's you know a good a good a good uh, home life is one of the ingredients, but there's so much more in this in this kind of complexity of of being human. Um, I, I, I think I guess I feel like we're coming to the end um, of our conversation for the time being. Um, I don't know if it's fair a, a fair question to ask, but I was wondering whether if there was one thing, one thing from sociocracy that you would you would say, yeah, this is this is like this is my most helpful thing in terms of that conflict piece. Um, which would it be? Yeah, maybe building or basically, yeah, building on what we've just said. I think what my biggest learning was, and that's something everybody can take, uh, is systemizing things like, for example, your meeting format. And f for that, for example, to include your meeting evaluation, just the way meetings are run, that we, if we just focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, systems are your best friend creating those intentional moments and having an agreement about what those moments are. So everybody knows, you know, that's sort of a summary of all the things that we've talked about, right? There's the feedback piece, there is the systems piece, and there is the clarity piece because the whole clarity, if it's just in my head, doesn't help. It needs to be shared and mutually acknowledged and agreed upon, right? And then, so just having a good meeting format rounds, if I can add half of one to that. Um, but that, that gets people a long way already. Um, that's not even talking about decision making all of that just just being in the same room and working on an agenda mm. so that might be and that seems like an un, uncommon or unusual choice but in the context of what we've talked about i think that's the most logical choice here because out of all the good stuff that's seen yeah yes that kind of that kind of um openness and clarity and structure um, and i guess you know that can be tailored to to uh, the, the particular context that you're in. Um, so, it, you know, if, if you're working in a small organisation, that that framework might look different from if you're talking about kind of community meetings. Or but but that it's there and that everybody knows that it's there. And also that it's something that you can change and evolve. So if you find you're missing a piece, um, then you can add that in. But then that's done in a, in a kind of way that makes sure that people are consulted. And, and uh, have shared in that decision. I often think about it in terms of dancing or rituals because so much of what we do is kind of scattered, right, and kind of random or has a random scattered fragmented feel to it. And that's, for example, since we talked about the selection process earlier, I just love when something has, has a certain ritual feel to it because it's so calming and comforting to like, we all know what we're doing. And selections, for example, for those of, for those of us who know it, mm -hmm. I know you don't, they just have a, have a feeling like, oh, okay, now comes this thing, right? We all know the drill and we just go through it. And it's, um, and I think we just need more of that energy in our life of, you know, we all know, like, this is what's happening. And it's like dancing together, right? Because sometimes people are like, oh, I don't want to have a strict process. They're like, you know what? That's not how I see it, right? I see it more like we all know what, I don't know, whatever dance we take, you know, what um, tango is like. We know the basic moves. And then we're free to do it, but just random is not going to work, right? So mm -hmm. let's just have a basic framework in place and then let's take it from there. That's where, for me, flow comes in and ease comes in and all of those things that I'm looking for, for to have more in my life um, mm -hmm. because I enjoy them. Yeah. Comfort. That's really interesting. I, I hadn't really noticed that, but... I really, I can really relate to that sense of, yeah, okay, so now we're doing the check-in. Things that have become real habits for me, but relatively recently. Um, and there is something about, yeah, yeah, you know, I've been in a hundred check-ins and yet everyone's new. Um, and, I, you know, they come right at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is, it is like a dance. That's a nice metaphor. 
Okay. Any any last things? Or should we say goodbye? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always a last thing, but right now I think I'm just um just feeling pretty complete. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about hearing all the other things in during the conference. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely to talk to you.